Good morning. I hope you are all well. And it's so good to have this opportunity to spend time to, to reflect on these first 10 verses, particularly the last verse of uh, the last, you know, verse 10 of, of Ephesians chapter 2, as Paul uh, writes to, to the church. Because in this passage, there are so many riches to, to explore, to enter into. It reminds us of what we once were. It reminds us of who God is, of what he has done and what he will do. It reminds us of all that we have been drawn into because of our identity in Jesus. And it ends by reminding us of what God expects of us now. One of the things that God expects of us. It reminds us that in our natural state, before we came to know Jesus, we were, we were disobedient to God. We deserved his judgment. And as a consequence, uh, we referred to as dead, meaning that we had no relationship with God at all. It reminds us that God has a great inexhaustible love for us. It reminds us that God treats us with mercy. He doesn't treat us as we deserve. It reminds us that God has brought us from death into life and he's given us a place with his son. It's worth spending a few moments thinking about how the passage works. And I think there are three main headings that give us a structure for it. In verses 1 to 3, we, we hear that we were dead in our sins, our natural state. In verses 45, we hear this amazing, wonderful news that God has made us alive with Christ. And then in verse 6, he, he says what he's done beyond that. He's raised us up and seated us with Christ. And the rest of the passage provides more details regarding each of these realities. So uh, verses 2 to 3, for example, explain what it means to be dead in sin, whose influence we were living under, and how that caused us to live. So the passage speaks about the human condition, and then goes on to speak about God's wonderful response to that, how he was not prepared to leave us where we were, but to draw us into something that was so much greater, so much more wonderful. And this morning I want to explore two things from this passage. What God has done for us, in and through his Son, and what God expects of us because of this. So, what has God done for us in Jesus? In verse 5 we have God's response to us being dead in our transgressions and sins that Paul has just described in verses 1 to 3. He has made us alive. He has restored us to life. If we go right back uh, to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 2, we read about, in verse 7, God breathing into the nostrils of Adam to give him life, resulting in that first man becoming a, a living creature, being truly alive and unable to live in relationship with God. Sadly, in the next chapter, we see Adam and Eve disobeying God's command to them, entering into a state of spiritual death, of separation from God. When Jesus, hundreds of years later, appeared to his disciples after his resurrection, he breathed on them and spoke about them receiving the Holy Spirit. We get this in John 20, 22. An act reminding us of the new life that God has given us. The rebirth, the renewal, made possible through Jesus enabled through the Spirit. Because of what Jesus has made possible, that state of sin-caused separation from God is reversed and we are made alive again. God once again gives his people life. He breathes into them. He enlivens them. Interestingly, actually, the actual Greek verb used here doesn't mean making something become alive. But making some, something or someone come alive with someone or something else. It only appears twice in the New Testament, here and in Colossians 2.13, where Paul is making a similar statement about God making believers in Jesus alive with Jesus. There's an unbreakable connection between the act of being made alive and the one who made this possible. Without Jesus, we could not have entered into this new life. We could not have been made alive. It's a similar idea to someone getting a new lease of life when receiving a kidney donated by someone else. 
their improved life would forever be built on the fact that someone had given them that wonderful gift and enabled them to experience a vastly improved life. All that they were able to do in the rest of their life that they had not been able to do before the moment of that transfer, that transplant, flowed from, resulted from that gift that they had received. But what God has done in Jesus is so much more. He's given us new life based on the power of the indestructible life that Jesus enjoys and is spoken about in Hebrews 7. All that we are in God, all that we were able to experience of him, all that we're able to do for him is because of the new life of Jesus that he's breathed into us. Something we were totally unable to do for ourselves. But something that God did for us because he has a great love for us and chose to act mercifully towards us. And then in verse 6, Paul goes on to explain some of the implications of having been given this new life in Christ. That God has given us a new position also with and in Christ. And we see the same use of the verbs here where raised and seated are tied directly to our relationship with Jesus. Here Paul goes further than any other passage that I can think of in making the claim that God has already raised up believers and seated them with Jesus in heaven. In Colossians 3.1, by comparison, where Paul is thinking about similar things. There, believers are encouraged to focus on heavenly ideas where Christ is seated at God's right hand and to look forward to that day when they will join him. Here, Paul writes as though that has already happened. That we have been raised up. We have been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We know, however... But the reality is we are still here on earth, subject to all the challenges and difficulties that raises. So how do we reconcile these two ideas? And again, it comes back to the work of the Spirit, whom Paul has previously described in, in chapter 1, verse 13 to 14, as, as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. We do not fully experience this now, but it is something we can be so confident in, it is as though it has already happened. I was watching a TV programme uh, a month or so ago where a father promised to be home in time for Christmas. But something cropped up and he was unable to fulfil his promise. And the reaction of his children suggested that this was something they'd become used to. But it is the exact opposite when we think about being raised and seated with Christ. God has promised it. Jesus has made it possible. The Spirit guarantees it. It is just as definite as though it had already happened. What a great future awaits us. And we are encouraged to live our lives today with a deep awareness of this reality. And because of this, we can look forward to a time when God will show us the incomparable riches of his grace as he acts to walk kindly towards us because of Jesus. This is verse 7. Many of us, have experienced wonderful blessings from God that we rejoice in and celebrate. But there is so much more ahead of us as God will pour out his richest blessings upon us, blessings that cannot be compared with anything else. And Paul reminds us that it was with grace that our relationship with God started, as he saved us from sin and death as a free gift from God. It's in verse 8. This salvation was not something we could work for. It was only something we could accept as a free gift from God. And God will continue to pour out the riches of his grace upon us in ways that we can't yet fully imagine or understand. And with all of that in mind, the wonderful things God has done for us in Jesus, the work of the Spirit in our lives, the grace we have received and will continue to receive, Paul reminds us that this calls us to live in a certain way, to do as verse 10 says, the good works that God has prepared for us to do. Let's just remind ourselves again of what he says in that verse. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And this raises all sorts of questions 
that are well worth thinking about, reflecting on, rejoicing in. What does it mean to you that you are God's handiwork, God's workmanship? What does being created in Christ Jesus mean to you? And how do you feel about a purpose in your life, a focus of doing the good works which God has prepared for you? I find these ideas wonderful, uplifting, but challenging and life-changing. Let's think about them a little, and as we do, allow these concepts to change us and transform us. So we think about God's handiwork. Many of us will have gone to places like Ikea and bought flat pack furniture and put it together with differing degrees of success. We will have looked at the results of our labours and recognised the great artistry and skill which has gone into it or otherwise. And many of us will have visited stately homes or museums and seen some of the ornate furniture which, which was lovingly and painstakingly constructed by skilled cabinet makers using the skills and abilities which they developed over many years of training and experience. And in our honest moments, we would probably concede that the results of our toil aren't quite to the same level of craftsmanship as some of theirs. We would have seen amazing buildings constructed over tens of years by armies of skilled workers and marvelled at what they were able to produce. We see it in the attention to detail which goes into making exquisite items of jewellery or developing grand landscape gardens. Wherever we go, we see evidence of things that have been made or built or grown by people with real skill and ability and a deep love for what they were doing. These are not things hastily thrown together, but things carefully developed and nurtured. And this, I would suggest, is what we think of as handiwork, with a sense of real talent, real care, real commitment. But what is the sense of the word in, in the way in which Paul uses it here? It only occurs in the New Testament twice, once here and once in Romans 1.20, where Paul is speaking about how the creation of the world demonstrates the power and nature of God. He says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. And it's that word made towards the end of that verse, uh, that's the same word that's translated as uh, handiwork or workmanship in Ephesians 2. And so there, Paul is saying that we can get an insight into who God is by looking at what he has made and the wonders and the beauty of creation. In looking at that, we get the idea of a God who is powerful, innovative, imaginative, eternally creative, coming up with amazing things in the, in the natural world around us and beyond us. He has made the world as he chooses. And it is how it is, because he designed it that way. And as Paul tells us here in Ephesians, something similar happens in the lives of his people. He takes care over us to, to make us and form us and transform us into the people that he wants to be. His innovation and imagination is at work in us, making us the unique individuals that we are. We are the fruits of God's handiwork. Just take a moment to reflect and to rejoice in and to savour that, that, that idea. We, you, each of us who own the name of Jesus, are the fruits of God working in our lives. And just as the, the natural world is always being changed and transformed, so, so God is continuing to work in us. We are not yet finished products, but we do the, bear the marks of God working in us and shaping us. The NRSV uh, puts this in a slightly different way. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. How does it make you think about yourself? when you are faced with this claim that you are the result of God's work in your life. 
How does it make you feel about other people? Those whom you know, maybe those whom you don't really like, when you realise that they are what God has made them. And incidentally, we shouldn't allow this to make us think that it's okay to carry on doing the things which know are wrong, because God has made us like that. A skilled carpenter, when he or she is making something, will notice things that are not right and remove them or plane them down to produce something of perfection. We need to be prepared to allow God to continue working in us to transform us into who we should really be. Let's not allow ourselves to be content to stop part way through that process and to say, well, that's good enough. Let's allow God to continue to change us and transform us to be more like Jesus. Which takes me on to that next idea. What does being created in Christ Jesus really mean? What does it mean to you? Again, Paul is reminding us that God does his creative work in and through his son. John's gospel at the beginning there tells us that God, that Jesus was the agent of creation who brought everything into existence. And as God works in his people today, he does it through his son. Being created in Christ Jesus brings us into new lives and new experiences. And as we saw in some of the earlier verses in this passage, there are hints as to what is going on, what God has done, what God is doing, what God will do. Do we really realise who we are? And what God has brought us into. Do we need to take hold of this and allow it to change and transform our lives? Do we live as people who have been created, created anew, given new life in Christ Jesus? What difference does that make to how you live compared to, to those who you know who don't have that same life-changing, transforming experience of Jesus. And Paul highlights here that the consequence of our created state, created in Christ, is that we should do good works. Because of what God has done for us, because of who we are, we should be involved in doing these good works. Paul is careful in this passage in how he positions these works. They are not something which we do in order to earn God's favour or respect. They are not something we do so that we can enter into all the good things which we've just been thinking about. As we saw in the earlier verses in this passage, we receive God's blessing through his, his grace because of his mercy by our faith. Just as someone gives us a gift at Christmas or birthdays or on other special occasions, they do it because they want to, because they care about us, because they love us. We have the option to gratefully and willingly accept it from them or to refuse it and say that we aren't going to take anything which we haven't earned, that we will go our own way. We do not need what they have to offer. And as we look at all that God is freely offering us, we have a choice as to whether we are going to gratefully receive it and accept it or whether we're going to say that we can live out our lives in such a way that God will have to accept us because of who we are two choices and Paul is clearly stating here and elsewhere that the first way is the way to enter into relationship with God accepting what Jesus offers us well the second one just doesn't work at all but once we have accepted God's gracious gift through faith then Paul tells us we should be involved in good works. These are not to gain access to God, but should follow on from the relationship into which he's drawn us and from the new life that he's given us. These good works carry with them the idea of godly behaviour. And later in his letter, Paul will give some guidance on what this means. But the overriding idea is living out a lifestyle which reflects God's own character and actions. And so it's not surprising that God is involved in these acts, in this lifestyle, to the extent that he's prepared it in advance for us to do. One of the things I find helpful when reflecting on how well I am living as a follower of Jesus is to ask myself, how much do I demonstrate the characteristics of Jesus? How does my life reflect the 
the life and the person and the, the nature of Jesus? And how much am I doing the sort of things that Jesus did? And it's the same idea here, that because of our life in Jesus, we are called to live in a way that reflects who Jesus is and what he did. God is working out his purposes. And in his eternal plan, we each have a part to play in making it all happen, in bringing his kingdom to earth. Not as mindless puppets or pawns on a chessboard, but as those who are living in the power of a newly created life and living in relationship with him. Some highly skilled and trained people spend their lives in restoring things of great beauty, furniture, paintings, houses. Their intention is not to change them from what they were designed to be, but to get rid of all the the muck and the rubbish which has been deposited on them over the years, which prevent their true nature being seen. When people look at us, when we look at ourselves, is God's creation and workmanship easily visible? Or are there areas of our lives where we need to ask him to restore us to what we are designed and created to be? Are there things which we are doing, are there ways in which we are living which prevent the deep beauty of God's work in us being seen? Do we recognise the wonderful things that God has done for us, creating us in Christ, freeing us from the sin which was hold us down, drawing us into a deepening relationship with him? Or are we prepared to live out our lives without these amazing things changing us and transforming us? To settle for second or third best. And not to live in the reality of the abundant life that Jesus came so that we could enjoy. Are we prepared to engage with God to try and understand what he's wanting us to do? And are we prepared to model our lives on how he wants us to live? What might it look like for you to be living in a way that wonderfully reflects God's own character and actions? How would that change how you think? How would that change what you say? How would that change the relationships you have? How would that change what you spend your time doing and how you do it? What would it change about every aspect of your life? Our passage opens with a reminder that once we were dead and separate from God, it goes on to talk about the transformation which God has done and continues to do in us as we live in Christ, and and it calls us to engage in the work which God is doing and the work in which he wants us to partner. Are we prepared to respond to that call? To respond to that call again and say, yes, here I am to God. Send me. Are we prepared to live out the reality of what God has done so that our lives are changed? So that our lives become more like Jesus. So that our actions become more like the actions that Jesus would do. So that in the power of the Spirit, we are living in the fullness of all that God wants to do for us. Are we prepared to be those agents for change in the world that God is calling us to be? May God bless us and encourage us as we reflect and as we think and as we pray into what God may be calling us to be and to do.